Hello and welcome back to I'll Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Maury of Drea Renee Knits and this is where I try my best to answer your questions. Um, today might be a little bit of a shorter one. I have not been feeling very well, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, today I'm wearing my Junction Pullover, which quite honestly is one of my absolute favorite sweaters. I wear it a lot. Um, it's knit out of Bichy Bouche there cashmere wool blend is the dark gray and then it's been cycled dyed in the wool and cast away um, and it's incredibly thin and lightweight but warm um, so I really love it and I will of course link to it below so let's jump into some questions question number one I know binding off should be loose and love how you mentioned going up a few needle sizes but should I cast on as loosely so this is a great question. The way I think about it is so many patterns read to cast on or bind off loosely. And when you think about it, I can't really think of a reason why we would want it to be tight because in general, we don't want that discomfort around our necks or our wrists or the hems or the edge of a shawl. Um, so in general, yeah, we always kind of want a nice flexible cast on. Uh, my go-to is the Twisted German cast on and I do have a tutorial for that. I'm going to go ahead and link it below. I also love, love, love the <clears throat> tubular cast on. Um, it's one of my absolute favorites and it also offers some really nice stretch. That one I would say is a little bit more advanced. The Twisted German can feel quite similar to doing a long tail cast on so I think that's a really great kind of intermediate stretchy cast on. And um, I also highly recommend if you just love any cast on really, um, but your typical go-to, maybe it's the long tail cast on, then I just recommend going up a few needle sizes. And it can actually be quite a few needle sizes depending on how stretchy you want it to be. The reason I choose to go up a few needle sizes instead of down is because, I'm sorry, not instead of down, but instead of just trying to be loose with it, I would rather my tools did the work than my hands because what's gonna happen with me is I'm going to be inconsistent. I'm gonna have a tight stitch and then a loose stitch and it's just really hard as humans to perfectly loosely cast on or bind off. So by just going up or down a needle size, that is going to um, help you have a really consistent looser bind on, off or cast on hold. Um, so, that's what I recommend. <laughs> um, next question. In relation to steaking, would you typically block the garment before or after cutting through the steak stitches? Does this make a difference to the end product? Is the answer to this question different if you're using different types of yarn, superwash versus super or versus non-superwash, etc.? Um, so I would block before sticking. In general, I think it's a good rule of thumb to block a garment before doing any of those kinds of techniques, whether it be sticking, I like to do it before picking up for a collar or a button band, before seaming pockets, um, before seaming a sweater. If you're seaming it, you definitely want to block beforehand. And that's gonna do a couple things for you. It is going to, depending on the stitch pattern, it's going to let that fabric go into the actual size it's gonna be um, before doing any of those things. You kind of want it to be at its proper measurements because depending on your seaming technique, generally you're gonna put in kind of a strong line of thread there that's not going to be as flexible as the rest of your fabric and so you want it to be to the size that it's going to block out before you kind of put in this reinforcing area if that kind of makes sense um and as far as yarn type i i do think that it can make a difference um Superwash and non superwash, generally a good rule of thumb, especially if you're newer into sticking, is you might want to stick with a non superwash yarn because that yarn has the ability ability to felt or full a little bit where those fibers will agitate a little bit and kind of grip onto each other 
um, making your steak a little sturdier. I have steaked with superwash yarn to great success. Um, if you're going that route, I do recommend using a sewn reinforcement where you actually use a sewing machine to go over and lock those stitches because that yarn is slippery um, compared to a non-superwash yarn and won't have as much grip and it won't ever felt into place the way that a non-superwash will. And when I say felt, I'm not talking about felting it to the point of it being a complete matte fabric. It's just even a little bit of agitation is gonna take super non-superwash yarns and help them grab onto each other to, <coughs> excuse me, um, to create that stability. So when we block, before we steak, you're already kind of helping that process along of things, settling into place and kind of grabbing onto each other a little bit. Um, so yes, I would block before steaking. And then a lot of times what you're going to want to do is then you would steak, add your button band, and then block again. Because you're going to probably want that button band, if it's ribbing especially, to open up. All right. What's your favorite? Oh, this is back to, we talked about cast downs before, and now we're going to talk about bind offs a little bit. What's your favorite bind off for sweaters and cuffs? One that offers that kneaded stretch, but doesn't curl or flare. So my go-to generally is a tubular bind off um, because I love how it looks with ribbing. It makes it look like it goes right over the edge of the sweater instead of kind of creating a hard line at the end of it. But if I'm not doing a tubular bind off, I will either simply go up a few needle sizes and um, bind off just a regular old bind off, knit two stitches, pull the first over the second, or Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off. If you really need something with some stretch, that's a great option. I really love using that bind off around a shawl collar, especially if it's done in garter stitch. Um, and I will bind off with the wrong side of my work facing, and when you turn it to the right side, Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off will actually almost look like a little um, faux eye cord bind off. It has sideways knit stitches is what it looks like and it's just really it can look really beautiful and polished so I'll link that bind off below um, but if I'm just binding off in ribbing pattern to keep that stretch for something like socks I might even go up like five needle sizes. I have used a size seven needle to bind off my size two socks and I'm talking about US needle sizes there. Um, so, and it still looked great and it allowed me to kind of tug as much as I wanted to on that yarn without worrying that I was gonna bind off too tightly. All right, next question. Have you ever gone back after blocking to make changes to a knit? Example, after blocking and wearing a sweater once, I would like to add more length to the body. Is it possible to do or a terrible idea? It is totally possible to do, absolutely. Go back in there, make those alterations because you're gonna wear that sweater so much more if you really get it the way you want it. And with re-blocking and wear, it should be totally fine. Um, so I've absolutely done that. I have added sleeves to a sleeveless sweater afterwards. I have lengthened or shortened sleeves. Um, and I've also finished a sweater, worn it and decided, you know, I thought this was gonna be my style, but it's not. So I unraveled the whole thing, soaked the yarn and hung it to dry and was able to reuse that yarn. So the great thing about being a knitter is that we can take advantage of the fact that we get to reuse our materials if it's not quite right. And I also believe strongly that getting into our finished knits and making those adjustments, it's gonna teach you so much more about that fabric and creating knitwear that you really love to wear. And that is the ultimate goal, right? So getting in and trying those alterations, I think is kind of the only way to really learn it. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. So, last question. I am so frustrated with swatching. I understand because my swatch rarely matches my garment gauge. I just checked my garment gauge and it's significantly tighter than my swatch. Um, looks like, oh yeah, 28 stitches per four inches or 10 centimeters to 25.5 stitches per 10 centimeters, four inches. 
Um, I always record dry as well as blocked, that's awesome, so that I can compare my garment to my swatch. Um, I completely understand. You may have heard swatches lie. <laughs> so there's a lot that can happen between our gauge swatch and the actual thing we're knitting. And there's some best practices you can try to help um, fix that situation. One is always make sure that you are swatching the way that the garment is knit. And the fact that you do measure your swatch before like pre and post blocking kind of tells me that you might already do a lot of these best practices. Um, but if you are knitting a garment in the round, but you swatch flat, you will definitely see a big change in gauge because in general, we all tend to knit a little bit tighter in the round than we do flat because we're never working a purl stitch. Generally, obviously stitch patterns and things come into play there, but let's say it's just a stock and that fabric. What happens with our purl stitches is the way we wrap our yarn for a purl stitch actually uses up like a little bit more yarn than our knit stitch does. So those are going to be slightly looser stitches than our knits. So when we're working flat, overall, that will create a looser tension. So less stitches per inch. When we then knit in the round, we're only ever doing knit stitches, so we're gonna use less yarn overall, and we're gonna end up with a tighter fabric having more stitches per inch to our gauge. So if you are going to knit a project that's knit in the round, you really want to swatch in the round. Now, here's where it gets even trickier is small circumference knitting, we will tighten up even more than large circumference knitting. So there's something, I don't know if it's working magic loop or on double pointed needles that create that makes us knit tighter. I don't know if it's the fact that we don't ever have to really stop and stretch all of our stitches over a longer cord like we do in the body of a sweater, but I have found almost across the board, most knitters that I have come across will knit tighter, small circumference, i.e. a sleeve, than large circumference, such as the body, which is why I've actually started in almost all of my patterns stating to use one size up on their needle for their sleeves because that gauge change tends to happen. So that's something you really wanna pay attention to. I'm not sure for the project now, if A, you did swatch in the round or flat, and if B, right now, if you're currently working on the sleeve or the body, some sweaters, you do start sleeves first. So that could also be the reason why you're seeing such a discrepancy in your gauge, could be because that if you are working a sleeve and you're working over small circumference, that could be part of that issue. Um, also, I would be curious, you did say that you record your pre and post blocking gauge. So I'm guessing when you say there's such a large discrepancy that you have blocked that part of the sweater or maybe you are checking your pre-blocked gauge against what you're working on now. Um, I would almost what I'd wanna do before you throw that project into the frogging bin would be to throw it on some waist yarn and block it just to see what happens. Um, Cause you never know as we knit bigger pieces of fabric than a swatch, how that might alter. So you could try blocking it and seeing if it does end up measuring the gauge you need uh, before undoing it. Um, other things to consider is knitting a larger swatch. The larger the swatch you knit, more accurate of a reading you're gonna be able to get. Because when we knit a bigger project than what we swatched, it takes more time and our moods change. And as our mood changes, sometimes our gauge can change. If we are in a stressful situation, maybe even just watching an intense show, you might actually start tense, tightening up your knitting and not even realizing it. Or maybe you're doing a project that makes you a little nervous. So while you're swatching, you're kind of swatching a little tighter than your relaxed gauge might end up being when you're actually into that project and you relax into it. It can be quite common. There are quite a few people who they just, once they're into a project, they relax more and their gauge loosens up. Um, so knitting a larger swatch might be able to help give you a more accurate reading. And 
yeah, I think those are my main tips for that one. But I do understand the frustration of feeling like you can't trust your swatch because <laughs> um, it's really frustrating as you're working. You're like, and then you start doubting it. But that's why I would consider um, maybe throwing it on some scrap yarn and giving it a block and seeing what that does. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, bonus question. Hello, I wondered if you could show us how to wrap up in the hoarfrost shawl. I was so excited somebody asked this. I don't know if y'all have noticed, but I've had hoarfrost up here on the mannequin for the past few episodes. It's one of my all-time favorite shawls. I love it so much, and I feel like it's kind of one of my little unsung heroes, so I'm really excited to show y'all how to wear that one today. And go check out the pattern pictures too, because I show a couple different ways to wear it. Um, Shortly after I released that, I did a couple events where I actually had a dress that I would wear it over tied. Um, and so it can be fun to kind of style that one in different ways. But I will show you my favorite way to wear it now. All right. <laughs> Back to my kneeling situation here. So this is the Horfrost shawl. Um, I love this has a really great knit pearl texture. I'll show it close up after I try it on that builds up the body of the shawl and then it moves into one of my favorite lace patterns in the world, which is this pine cone lace. So as always, so this is a asymmetrical triangle shawl. So as always, I start with the longer end and wrap that around my shoulder like so and then i take i'm actually going to bring it over just a little bit more and then i just take the rest of the shawl doo -doo -doo, and throw that over my other shoulder and that's it that's it's an easy peasy one and i just love it it's one of my all-time favorite shawls um so thank you whoever asked that question so here is that beautiful pine cone lace i love it I haven't done lace in a while. Maybe I need to cast on a new lace project. Um, especially in worsted weight. I love that it like magnifies the lace. And then here is that beautiful knit pearl texture. So I have, it's bright. Um, I have used this in a few different patterns because it's so relaxing and it just gives such a beautiful texture and it's it's easy to do, it's easy to memorize. I've used it in my oxbow cardigan. Um, I think I used it in a couple other things, but my memory fails me right now. Um, yeah. This was knit up in, oh my goodness, what was it called? Lakes Organic, I feel like I might be getting that name wrong. Um, unfortunately, is it lakes? Yeah, lakes, um, lakes yarn and fiber. I feel like there was an organic in there, but I guess not. Um, I really, really love their yarn. Unfortunately, they, I don't think are making yarn anymore. Um, I still have some in like my favorite ice blue color ever that I have in my stash that I've been saving because I'm like, I can't get it anymore. But any worsted yarn would do. Um, so that's Horfrost. All right, y'all. Sorry I'm a little unwell today, but thanks for coming back and joining me. I hope to be back next week feeling better. And then the week after that, I think it's Ryan back, which is crazy. Um, so I'm super excited to go to that. And if you're going, I hope to see you there. Please come say hi. We will be at the Hill on Saturday afternoon in our Illuminate sweaters. And I'll be at Wool and Folk on, I think that's on the 14th. Yes, it is. And I'll be there from three to 3.30 doing a special little event. Um, so I hope, to see you there and if not maybe virtually definitely if you're knitting illuminate make sure to tag me in your photos i'm gonna um i'm excited as we get closer i'm gonna start showing a bunch of those in my instagram story so if you're on instagram make sure to tag me in your photos so i can show off your illuminate if you'd like to share it with others and i hope you'll have a great weekend it officially feels like fall here we had our first fire in the fireplace last night and it was so great i just spun yarn and drank hot lemon water and enjoyed a fire so happy weekend i'll see y'all next week <laughs>